Hello. Today we are completing part one of the animal reproduction unit um, in ARGS 105. But first a joke. What do you call a cow that's just had a calf? Decaffeinated. <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. Our focus today will be chapter 10 in the textbook. It covers reproduction, and we will focus in on an even smaller part in this lecture about female and male sex organs. Please make sure you read chapter 10 in the textbook and take notes on it. It's important for you to know that the human brain usually has to see a piece of information 21 times before it becomes part of your knowledge base. So if you read it, write it down, take notes, um, hear it again in the lecture, see it on the quiz, all of those are integral parts to your knowledge base. I would also recommend that you watch this short YouTube video. I learned some things from it um, regarding different types of mammal pregnancies and mammal reproduction. It was really interesting. You're going to love it. Now, why is reproduction important? Reproduction is truly the key to life. Um, when there is no reproduction, we see a species end. And this is notable and seen um, definitely in zoos when we deal with endangered species. Sometimes they cannot provide the correct habitat for them to breed. When that happens, we usually see a species die out. In the livestock industry, however, reproduction has an even more significant economic importance because the offspring of an animal typically equate to the profit. So if, for example, a cow is not reproducing and doesn't have any calves, there is nothing to sell to offset her costs as um, a female in the operation. And so she um, is hard to keep around. It's hard to pay for cattle in that situation. So producers need to know the reproductive process, including estrus cycles, mating systems, pregnancy, um, birth, neonatal care, how to pick animals to breed to. There's a lot of details involved. We're going to start with the females. Um, the things we talk about are pretty common between all of the farm animal mammals, and you see those here on the screen. I would actually recommend at this point that you pause this video and make some space in your notes for each of these female reproductive organs. Um, we'll talk about them individually, and we'll look at them as a whole when we're looking at a diagram. But it's important for you to know about the follicle, the ovary, the infundibulum, which I'm still not sure I say right, the oviduct, the uterus, cervix, vagina, and vulva. So now, let's start by looking at a diagram. Um, these are all of the female reproductive organs looking um, at the, from the side of a cow. Um, you can see that the ovary um, starts, things start in the ovary, it then goes into the infundibulum, which then goes into the oviduct. The oviduct leads into the uterus, which is separated from the vagina by the cervix, and the cervix plays a really important part. Um, in keeping the inner reproductive organs of a cow clean and sterile for the fetus. Um, you can see that all of this is um, located under the rectum and the anus of the cow. This is a dorsal view of the cow's reproductive tract and a sow's reproductive tract side by side. There are some things about them that are very different. One of the main differences is driven by how many babies a cow has at one time versus a sow. Um, so pigs have litters, and that means some things are different in their reproductive system, whereas a cow typically has one, maybe two calves at a time, and so that influence on the reproductive track um, makes a big deal. I think you see the most difference in how the uterine uterus and uterine horns are shaped. Here's a diagram of yet another different reproductive system. This is a horse. The mare's uterine horns are fused with the body of the uterus itself. 
So they're not really even separate. That changes the shape of the uterus yet again. Um, this is also the region where the foal is carried. Um, roughly same spot for the bladder um, in the cow and the sow and the mare. Now let's talk about things in a little bit more detail. Um, first we talk about ovaries. Ovaries produce the largest single cell in the body, which is the egg, or also called the ova. Um, the singular of the word ova is ovum. Ova is the name of the female sex cell, and it's what joins to the sperm with the sperm to create an embryo. Ovaries are also responsible for producing the hormones estrogen and progesterone. Both are very important in in the time leading up to pregnancy and also during pregnancy. Each ovum develops inside a follicle. Follicles are really tiny when they start developing and they start at the center of the ovary. And then as they develop, they get larger and they move to the outside. And it's actually the follicle that, release, that produces and releases the estrogen. When the follicle has reached its mature size, it ruptures and releases the egg. We call that Ov ovulation. After the follicle has released the ovum, it becomes a corpus luteum or a yellow body. You'll read more about that in the text. The corpus luteum produces progesterone, which is vitally important in maintaining pregnancy. Now here's a picture um, seen as a microscope. Um, this is actually a follicle lo located in a cow's ovary, and it's magnified 265 times. The smaller circle near the center is the egg, and the large light gray circle is the fluid that fills up the follicle. When the follicle ruptures, the egg moves into the oviduct, um, and then later into the infundibellum. After the ovum is released from the mature follicle, it's captured, the, captured by the infundibellum. Um, and that is at the top of the oviduct. It's a little bit shaped like a hand. And so it kind of captures it and guides it down into the oviduct. Now it's important that the egg reach the oviduct because that's where the ovum will become fertilized. If the animal has ex been exposed to a male either through live cover or through artificial insemination. So the oviduct is the true site of ovulation. Um, if it is fertilized, um, it becomes an embryo. And after fertilization, it takes three or five days for the embryo to pass through the remainder of the oviduct and into the uterus. If it's a successful pregnancy, this is where it attaches to the uterine lining and it stays for the remainder of the development. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of places in that process where things could go wrong. And this is, this is what we see when animals don't breed. Um, say you purchase a new heifer, you've turned her in with a bull two years in a row, you just can't get her to breed. Many times it can be re related back to a cellular level about something going wrong within this process. Other times it can actually be traced back to the male. This is a really cool picture in terms of um, perspective because this shows how large the egg is in comparison to the sperm. You can see the sperm right down there at the very bottom of the screen. Um, this has been magnified 300 times. And so in real life, it's about one two hundredth of an inch in diameter. Now the sperm is so small that at the head of the sperm, it's only one six thousandth six thousandth of an inch in diameter. So sperm cells are significantly smaller than egg cells. All right, now for the uterus. The uterus is where the embryo develops into a fetus and it stays there until parturition, which is another word for the birthing process. An embryo becomes a fetus when the placenta starts to develop. Um, and when that happens, it's actually about a tenth of the way into the pregnancy. As we saw, the uterus varies in shape and size from species to species. Some have a very short body but long uterine horns, like the sow. Others have a really large uterine body 
that is mostly fused to the horns, um, like in the mare. So in the sow, it's interesting because the embryos develop in the uterine horn, whereas in the mare, the embryo develops in the body of the uterus. Um, so this goes back to the logic of a sow having a litter. You'll see similar changes in reproductive systems for any animal that has offspring in a litter. The exit of the uterus is actually through the cervix. The cervix is made of a really tough connective tissue and it's kind of considered the gateway between the uterus and the vagina. When the animal is pregnant, it is very tightly closed. Um, and then it, it becomes very um, supple during the birthing process. One of the um, important parts of a pregnancy is what's called the cervical plug. The cervical plug prevents anything from getting through the cervix into the uterus. It's actually just a plug made of mucous tissues. Um, it makes the uterus um, stay free of any sort of bacterias, um, or foreign bodies that would hurt the offspring. Um, so the cervical plug keeps the uterus clean, if you will. And we know that that's one signal or um, step at the beginning of the birthing process is that oftentimes animals will lose their plug. The cervix joins the uterus and the vagina. Um, the vagina is the female organ of copulation, and so this is where the reproductive um, organs of the male join the females during mating. This is also the birth canal during parturition. The bladder also empties into the vagina, and this is another reason that the cervical plug is really important during pregnancy. Um, in some animals, urine kind of pools in the vagina, which carries a certain amount of um, potential for infection with it. Um, so having that plug block off the vagina until the birthing process is really important. The external part of the vagina that um, you can see is actually called the vulva and it's right below the anus. Um, when you need to check the sex of a newborn animal, the easiest way to do that is actually by lifting up the tail and checking for a vulva. Um, that's the most apparent way to check the gender on a baby animal at birth. Okay, next we'll head into the male species. Um, the male species are just as important as the female species, but for different reasons. Um, when we select females for a production facility, we're looking for um, animals that will raise a, a young offspring well, that they have good milk production, that they give birth easily, that they have genetics that we want to carry on, that structural confirmation and things. But the, easy, the easiest way to change her genetics is actually through a male. Because most males breed so many females in a production operation, um, this allows their genetics to be spread very, very quickly. We will also talk a little bit about artificial insemination, which is allowed by most industries. And that is another way that we can raise the quality of an animal. Here's the list of male reproductive organs you should know. Again, I would pause the video for a minute, take some time to put these into your notes if you don't already have them. Um, getting used to terminology is a big deal in any sort of science related career including agriculture. So we'll talk about the testes, the seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, vas deferens, ampulla, urethra, the sigmoid flexure, and the penis. Similar diagram to that that we looked at in the cow, we're gonna look at um, kind of the side view here of the bull's organs. Sperm production starts in the testes, um, which you can see on the screen. They are carried in the scrotum, and the scrotum is the part of the male animal that's external to the rest of the, rest of the body. Within the testes are the seminiferous tubules. They join into the epididymis, um, which you can kind of trace up as it goes more internal into the body. The epididymis joins into the vas deferens, which joins here into the ampulla. Just like with the cow, the urinary tract joins in at this point. 
um, and, and that would be at the urethra. Livestock males have something called a sigmoid flexure, which is the S-shaped part of the tubules, um, and it ends in the penis. Um, and that's the part of the, the organ of copulation and the part of the bull that, it, that exits the body. Next, we look at a diagram of a boar. You can see that it's very similar, but the testes are not kept quite as far outside the body. One of the interesting things about the scrotum is that they are responsible in any mammal for um, making sure that the temperature is correct for sperm production. Um, most importantly, we wanna keep that temperature cool enough because too much heat um, can cause a male animal to have lower sperm production um, or for the sperm to die. And so you, the scrotum really can pull the testes closer to or further away from the body to take care of that. Same thing, we start in the testes. They contain the seminiferous tubules, which join into the epididymis and then the vas deferens, mm -hmm. ampulla, urethra, and then onto the sigmoid flexure and the penis before the sperm exit the body. Now let's take a, a, a little bit of notes or just pay a little bit of attention to each of those individual type um, organs. Um, we'll start with the scrotum. The scrotum contains and protects the testicles. Um, it regulates temperature in the testicles like we talked about. And so that's part of the reason in mammals that the testicles are outside the body. If they were inside, the sperm would be unviable. One of the things that livestock producers do to ensure health of their males is actually to make sure that there is some shade available. And you will oftentimes see breeding males shade up during the hottest part of the day. Biologically, they also kind of know how to take care of themselves. Inside the scrotum, we have the testes. They have two main functions. That functions they produce the male sex cell, which is called the sperm cell, and they produce the hormone called testosterone. Um, it is testosterone that gives any male animal the masculine appearance and behavior. So we, that's why sometimes when we um, castrate an animal, we see a decline in some of the behaviors um, that are linked to testosterone, that um, the aggressiveness and things like that. Um, when you think about how an animal looks in a bull example, for example, we're going to call some of those um, ways that it looks like a bull. We, we want it to have a broader head. There's usually a little bit of a crest behind the head. They are muscular. Um, they're usually pretty powerful animals. The sperm are actually... Um, generated within the seminiferous tubules within the testes. And so it's important for us to know and um, maintain good health of those reproductive organs in males. This is a diagram of an ideal sperm cell of what they would look like. Um, there are three main parts to it, and those who study the viability of male animals really begin to look at how sperm are formed because each of the, the components, if you will, have an important part to their viability. There's the head, the midpiece, the principal piece, and then the end. Um, remember that sperm are extremely small cells. One of my favorite labs in high school, or I'm sorry, in college, was um, we had a professor that would collect stallions that morning and teach us how to do a sperm viability count live under the microscope. It's a really fascinating part of our industry. Now, more often than not, they're evaluating sperm looking for these different abnormality, abnormalities. Nobody wants to pay for a breeding male that isn't going to breed or produce good young. And so we evaluate sperm for the three Ms. The first is called morphology. That is actually the shape of the sperm. The second is motility, how much they move. And the third is morbidity. This refers to how many sperm cells are alive and how many are dead. 
Now each year before breeding, and certainly before any sort of sale, usually a breeding soundness exam is conducted on a male animal in addition to a fertility test. The sperm are collected, they're looked at under a microscope, and they evaluate for those three Ms. Now what does this mean for real life? Um, here's a couple examples. If there's a bent tail, obviously the sperm won't be able to move forwards as well, and that means it might not reach the ovum. Obviously that's also true if there's a detached tail, um, then it's just kind of a proximal, um, in the case of the proximal, proximal droplet, a small amount of fluid has already attached to the sperm cell, and that might keep it from moving also. Some of these abnormalities um, are co more common at a younger age and then get better as an animal ages. So they may do a sperm viability test at several different ages on an animal. When we um, collect male animals for artificial insemination, they also um, look at this, that, these viability um, M's. Sorry about that. There um, was a link to a really cool um, bull semen evaluation. I'm going to have to reevaluate that because for some reason the, the link just bombed out. A few more parts to talk about before we finish up today. The next one is called the epididymis. When the sperm cells from the testicles pass from the seminiferous tubules, they go into the epididymis. Um, it's highly coiled and it's held on the exterior of each testicle. Its actual functions are to concentrate, store, and transport sperm. And during that time, they actually also mature. Um, in bulls, the epididymis is a, between 95 and 115 feet in length. So that gives you kind of some ideas of, of how much tubule is wrapped up inside the body there. Um, in a sexually mature male animal, sperm reside in the epididymis in pretty large numbers. Um, they mature, some are degenerated, some reabsorb if they um, are not ejaculated. The epididymis empties into a larger tubule, which is called the vas deferens. The vas deferens is pretty much just a transportation tube. It carries the sperm, um, the sperm fluid um, from the epididymis into the urethra, and the end of the vas deferens is widened, and that part of it is called the ampulla. The ampulla is found in a bull, a stallion, a buck, and a ram, but, but that part of the vas deferens is not there in a boar. And finally, the urethra is a large muscular canal that extends from the bladder. Um, just like in females, the reproductive tract and the urinary tract join together. And so the urethra runs the full length of the penis. Finally, as we look towards the sperm exiting the body, um, it's important to recognize both the penis and the sigmoid flexure. Um, the penis is the organ of copulation. It is the passageway for both urine and semen. Um, with the boar, the bull, and the ram, the penis is actually S-shaped when, rela when it's relaxed. The S-shape is called the sigmoid flexure, and it straightens out during mating time. Um, this is really important when you're raising castrated males. They can actually get um, urinary stones that build up in the S-shape and cause some health problems for, for those steers or geldings. Um, it's kind of similar to what we humans would call kidney stones. And so that's a pretty good overview of both the female and male reproductive parts in animal agriculture. Have a great day.